So the question that I get a lot is, what current stressor is causing my symptoms? And I'd like to answer that a little bit in, in this podcast. And it's going to be general because it's different for everyone. Because, you know, we think that everybody is the same and that everybody needs to do the exact same kind of protocols and then you'll heal. But unfortunately, um, I, I don't believe that. So welcome to the Healing Differently podcast, a podcast where we talk differently about healing from a chronic disease, where we go away from the from the beaten path of brain retraining and detoxing, old school pacing, but where we really dive into the cause of the current symptoms. So I'm always interested not in your future symptoms, your past symptoms, but only about your current symptoms. So what is causing that? And if you like this type of content, then please subscribe, give it a a like, rate it on Spotify, as that would really help us to spread this message. Because yes, we have been discovering that we can turn symptoms on and off on demand. And to do that, we have to find that what is currently causing the symptoms. And it's not something that is happening to you, but it is something that is happening inside of you. And although the outside world might trigger that, because maybe you get involved into a situation and that can trigger, let's say, an emotion of anger or fear or unworthiness or a a, a, a thought from the the past, maybe your ex-partner could send you a message and before long, you develop symptoms. So for every kind of symptom, there is a stressor, and the stressor is inside of your body. But when the brain is perceiving these stressors as a danger, it's going to create symptoms to protect you. And these symptoms are very extreme, and we can call it mind-body symptoms, because we know exactly that the amygdala and the limbic brain is creating this via a process of slight oxygen deprivation, for example, but there are more ways possible. So these symptoms, let's say a migraine attack, depersonalization, fatigue, headaches, pain, you name it, they are there to scream louder than the actual stressor. And you have probably experienced that, that these symptoms are very overwhelming and very extreme. And that is exactly the purpose of these mind-body symptoms. To scream louder, so also to distract you from the place where the stressor is inside of your body. So these symptoms are then in your head, your neck, your back, your limbs, you name it. So that already tells us something about the stressor. Because the place where it is not, in the front of your body, let's say, between the, th- the, the throat and the bladder, that is where we can find the stressors. And you can actually feel that. So you can feel a pressure somewhere. So instead of focusing on the symptoms, we should focus on the line of breathing. That's where it is. But maybe you're not ready to do that. Maybe you have primed yourself in a way that you can't feel that no matter what. So it's not like, for example, I've heard this example that you wake up and you're going to check your emails and then there are like a lot of emails in your inbox and then you get anxious for answering all those those emails. That is something that that is new, but we're going to find something that was very old, something that is sort of like triggered by the emails. And that's always going to be a very extreme thing. And without preparation, I'm sure that that it's not going to end very well. For example, when I went to therapy, uh, we once did an EMDR session of of anger release. 
but I was completely unprepared, so I couldn't dive in fully. And as a consequence, a few minutes after the session did I develop a migraine attack. Now I've read today or something like that, or yesterday, that a migraine attack is caused by slight oxygen deprivation. So then I was like already th th uh, already uh, laughing a little bit inside of me. Okay, so that's it's officially TMS then. But the person who wrote it like had a lot of tools to get more oxygen into the brain. But instead, just like with a crash, for example, or pain, it's your body that wants this symptom. So nothing is going wrong. Everything is, everything is working fine. You don't need to fix anything. It's just that your brain has chosen this specific symptom for your protection. So it's serving you. And that's something very difficult to, to accept, I think. So on a, at an unconscious level, you'd rather have this symptom than something else. But these symptoms are destroying your life, especially in the long run. So how bad must the underlying stressor be, right? So let's say you have all these emails in your inbox. And instead of saying stop, there's no reason to be afraid. We're going to allow it that maybe you won't manage to answer all your emails. But is that really the cause of an extreme stressor? I think not. It merely triggered it. So what are you really afraid of in that moment? What is it that you try to avoid? And you you start then answering like, uh, uh, then I won't be able to, to do my job. Okay, well, what does that mean? Uh, I, I'll get fired. Okay, so what does that mean? I won't be able to pay the rent. Okay, so what does that mean? I must be living on the street. Okay, so what does that mean? I won't be able to survive. There you got it. So it's a survival thing. We activate the fight or flight mechanism to survive. So there is something and you must run away or fight and your life depends on it. But because when you were a child and you did not have any co-regulation, that's like someone being there for you when you have an emotion, um, you couldn't do this. So this fight or flight response is stuck inside of your body. And it's merely being triggered by the emails or a bad remark or being amongst friends or uh, seeing a, a beautiful person like that, that you want to be together with, for example. So what we do then, instead of saying that there is no reason or like just okay, be okay with not answering your emails, because that's not really dealing with the root problem behind this. The root problem behind this is that as a child, you entered the freeze response of the nervous system. You did not express your fight or flight response because of an extreme situation that you could not deal with on your own. And these situations are, of course, different for almost everyone. And it's not, this is not a popular topic because everyone likes to just say stop or be okay with not answering your emails because whatever you resist persists. So allowing is the key word then, but allowing what? That's where it really gets interesting. Allowing to not answer your emails or allowing that you won't be able to survive. You know, they might seem very different, but they're the exact same thing. But if you're talking about not answering your emails when you're in your 30s or 40s, it's it's a completely different thing than when you were in, in an extreme situation as a child and you had to freeze because you could not express your fight or flight response. So the difference between a common brain, brain retraining program 
or the release program is that they will tell you that there is no reason to to run away or to fight and that we tell you that you've got all the reasons to run away or to fight because a lot of different people do these types of programs and for the majority this doesn't work long term this means that it was not just something that they were in a negative loop with something bigger was going on beneath the surface and because i've been doing coaching sessions with clients with chronic diseases for over four years right now um yeah i've been developing this skill to find the underlying trigger so what is so bad that i need like 10 questions before you're willing to look at it so let's say you won't be able to survive then what then I'll, I'll, that thought alone is going to trigger your limbic brain and amygdala to create more symptoms so it's protecting you against a very overwhelming feeling that you won't be able to survive that you might die and this sounds probably very extreme but i mean i'm i've been dealing with thousands of different people with a variation in trauma there are a few people that um, that this moment of let's say for example in this example uh, the fear to not survive was caused in their childhood when mommy or daddy was away for a while and they were on their own or on the first day of school they were there without their parents and they didn't feel any safety and they shut down and entered the freeze response of the nervous system so these are still very light cases but it could, it could also mean that there was that there was severe abuse this can also be the case so if we then um at this at this moment with all these these online courses tell these people that it's okay you know like do not answer your emails that, that's not going to help them anyway and if you at the same time then ask them to push through with their lives to just keep going and to not fear the symptoms then they're going to be triggered again and again and again and again and again with these with this example i mean it's different for everyone they think they're going to think that they went over their limits that they did too much and depending on the severity of the trauma there is a delay this delay can be 10 minutes but it can also be three days so then we think that we have post-exertional malaise but instead you were triggered with the fear of not being able to survive but it's so suppressed that you need three days for it to come up to be triggered and then you create symptoms so in our work we want to expose you to all these kinds of, uh, of possible stressors and in that way you need less time between the trigger and the symptom and then when the symptom comes we're going to see what it was that caused it because the whole body is there to prevent you from feeling it even your thoughts even your symptoms and also the things that you would want from life so we have to go in the other way we have to find out what you're hiding at an unconscious level once we find it the symptoms they will increase and if we've done the preparation right we can express the stuck emotions the stuck fight or flight mechanism from the past that's that might have been stuck there for three decades for example if we then feel that if we go in and if, if we then try to release it then what is happening is that the body starts a sort of a release process maybe you start shivering shaking screaming gagging vomiting crying or laughing and all these things will happen without your control it's a, it's going to be a very emotional process the stressor that has been stuck there for let's say three decades is gone so a lot of people then ask me like i don't want to go in i don't want to re-traumatize myself well that's sort of a contradiction 
uh, because you, you, it's difficult to re-traumatize you again with something that you're not aware of yet because all these things are in the unconscious mind when someone enters the freeze response of the nervous system they shut down it's just like depersonalization you shut down and you don't process it so as a consequence there is no memory so you don't know what happened to you and and i don't want to invoke fear fear in you for that you, that you start thinking like what did happen to me then and maybe uh, you project your own fear that you have on this and you start coming up with all kinds of scenarios that's not really my intention i think that thinking is pretty useless because it prevents us from feeling so we go in with our feelings by tuning into the body to the place between the throat and the bladder that's where we process things like emotions and by feeling the stressor you automatically connect with it memories will come up and you start to remember slowly what happened but it doesn't have to be that way maybe all you feel is just the release process and an emotion and that's good enough and if we do this when you have severe symptoms then it's even easier because it's almost out there is just a tiny bit of resistance in your body to scream louder than the stressor so we dive in we feel it and we release it and it's gone no matter what happened to you all those years ago it's gone there is no reason anymore to think about and maybe yes maybe you should work slowly on creating a new relationship with for example existential fear or fear at all and and you can do that via preparation work preferably also before the session or before you do a guided session on your own but after that it's just gone so there's nobody is being re-traumatized so that's a very good thing then and slowly by slowly you will connect with more parts of yourself healing comes from whole holding becoming whole again so if you're not he healed it means you're fragmented in lots of bits and pieces because every time when you entered the freeze response of the body and uh, you were sort of like uh, denying a part of you let's say a five-year-old child with the existential fear that part of you is still there waiting to be reintegrated with you and after many layers of stress because there surely is not going to be just one event i hope for you but probably not you're going to make yourself whole again and i like the uh, the idea of the mosaic of a mirror that has been broken in a thousand different pieces at the end there was only one piece left with some consciousness but when you start gluing it all back together it becomes a mirror again not a perfect mirror but a work of art a mosaic and then we are in the process of getting back to ourselves again getting a relationship with all those fragments and that will change your entire life because before we were this tiny this tiny fragment and to not go inwards we were going outwards and we projected a lot of these things on the external world in order to not accept a part of yourself which is happening in the freeze response you reject a part of yourself but that part of you is coming again and again it's going to knock on a door but you're judging it but maybe you won't even see it that it's that it is an internal process maybe you even think that it's coming from outside of you that someone else triggered let's say fear someone else triggered anger and because of this rejection of yourself you're not going to feel at ease maybe you'll feel lonely but that loneliness might not be from the aspect of the mirror that you're currently ident identifying with it might be of another aspect that has been waiting there for 30 years 
to get to your attention again. But how do you react on loneliness in this case? What do you do? Do you project this on the external world and seek company or distract yourself from the feeling? Because that's only making it worse. That's like the type of loneliness that doesn't go away when you're among other people. Or maybe it does temporarily. But as soon as the activity of being around other people is over, you feel it again. It's in your mind. You're going to think about this. I think our brain, or let's say the mind, is a problem-solving machine. And there are problems. A lot of problems. Because the, the mirror that you are is not whole. So your brain is going to try and solve this. The problem is only that you're going to use this mechanism of thinking as a distraction. So it doesn't last long before you start identifying with your thoughts. You like all these tactics to get something. And I call these things coping mechanisms. For example, being among other people when you're lonely is a coping mechanism. And a coping mechanism only makes things worse because you'll never arrive and you only make the wound deeper. And most of the things that we do in our world are coping mechanisms. It's, it's, it's a very painful truth. And most of the things that we also do in our world is to not feel fear. So if I induce fear in you, by, for example, just telling you a story about something that can kill you. I'm going to activate, I'm going to trigger the uh, existential fear. But if you don't want to feel it, and if I can then come in via the back with a possible solution, I can manipulate you. That's what's been done all over the world with television and governments and, well, people do it to each other. If you don't want to have this fear in your life, then buy this product or this insurance and everything is going to be all right. Then you're going to buy that. For a brief moment, you have a placebo effect because the fear is no longer being triggered. You calm down. You think that you did something good. But nothing has been resolved itself. Nothing. And as a consequence... One day later, it might get triggered again. And all these aspects inside of you also have their own way of interacting with each other and their own feelings. So if you, for example, uh, push away the five-year-old boy with ex existential fear because on his first day of school, uh, he felt very insecure and threatened, to ha you remain having a five-year-old boy inside of you, inside of your psyche. To, to deal with this freeze response, you're going to develop uh, a coping mechanism. Let's say uh, being a very good student at school, a very good well, student is the word, a very good school kid, performing well, maybe pleasing the teacher. And whenever something is coming up, you automatically want to start a coping mechanism. So let's say again, I induce fear inside of you. And maybe I don't have to sell you anything, but I know that your coping mechanism is pleasing and I need to be, you know, there are, my bathroom is not clean and uh, someone uh, needs to uh, paint the house. And I can say, like, well, maybe uh, you can do it. <laughs> or maybe I don't have to say anything at all. Maybe before we all know what happens, you start doing it automatically. So that's a coping mechanism. It's an automatic mechanism to, def to defend you against a stressor that is inside of your body and to find somehow the opposite of what you're feeling internally. Why am I saying all these things? When we have a conversation in coaching sessions, I listen to you. And I ask some questions sometimes. And because of those coping mechanisms that I can detect, I can already find what it is that you're avoiding. And then out of the blue, I can just tell you that. But you will resist. You will talk over it. Because that's how you have been primed. That's how you have been conditioned. But I'm stubborn. I'll keep refocusing you to your stressor. 
existential fear. You want to talk again about something else. And I won't let you. I say it again. And at some point, this will frustrate you. And you will stop. And at that moment, your limbic brain and amygdala will have created symptoms to protect you. And this happened uh, a few years ago for the very first time in a coaching session. That hidden stressor was not existential fear, but extreme rage. Rage probably for not listening to your own boundaries, pleasing everyone, or, um, well, there's a lot of reasons to, uh, to have anger. But if anger is dangerous in your environment, then of course you're not going to support to express that you're not allowed to have your boundaries so of course later in life you will go over your own boundaries plus you won't respect anyone else's boundary and it's going to invoke a lot of anger so then that was the very first time that i did this did this in a coaching session i kept refocusing him to his anger and suddenly he was overwhelmed with symptoms and he's, he wanted to stop. I can't do the session anymore. I thought I could go through it, but it's probably has been too much for me. I need to stop. So at that moment, the limbic brain has created severe uh, fatigue, in this case, to protect you against rage. And the idea of the symptom is to not make you go further. So if he would have stopped the coaching call, the symptom would have won. He goes to his bed and he waits until the trigger and the emotions have wind down. That could take a day or three. And then after that, it's still in, in his body. So then he would have needed another trigger. And another, and another, and another. And every time he developed symptoms and it winds down, his healing journey is, is just stuck. It's not going, it's nothing has resolved itself. Nothing has been released. So instead we dived in and we allowed him his fight response. And it only took like five minutes in total. And he started having a beautiful release. And after that, it was just gone. So it might not be, you know, like the final solution for him. But at that moment, his symptoms disappeared. That's all that matters. So then he had a moment without symptoms. And he was feeling calm. His mind was calm instantly. And maybe he wanted to take a nap or lay down. But the symptoms were gone. This is a very important thing. Some people, they, uh, they're in a rush to heal. But then you have had the experience that you can turn a symptom on and off on the mouth. And that's everything. If you, if, you, if you have experienced that once, then maybe the next time you still feel very afraid of the symptom. But there is some sort of voice inside of your head that tells you your name and, and then whispers, maybe, maybe it's an emotion. Maybe we can dive in. And then you just do that. I mean, what do you have to lose anyway? I um, had the alignment recovery program, which was sort of the predecessor of what we're doing now. Back then I didn't really understand it, but it was a lot about psychological health and having a new relationship with yourself. And after doing that program, and especially after doing the release program, you're going to feel just more whole, better inside of your own body, better boundaries more peace of mind. So what do you have to lose? It's like the opposite. If you don't do a release process, then maybe you have to wait, to wait four or five or six days for your symptoms to wind down. And then on the very first day, without like, a, well, on the very first okay day, you might get triggered again. Maybe the news. Maybe the atomy bomb thing right now. 
And then that triggers again that, that feeling, that existential fear. And then you immediately get symptoms. And at the television, they play into this because then they want you to be okay with war. Let's say we sent more bombs to, uh, to, the, to that country. So that becomes then the coping mechanism to be okay with someone else's action to have a war. And that's how we've been manipulated all the time. That's how you manipulate yourself. As soon as you are um, triggered with an extreme emotion that triggers the fight or flight response, but you're still in, uh, in the freeze response, then there is no clear thinking at all. So your, your mind will go rampant, but there is no clear thinking whatsoever. So none of the actions that you think that you are going to do will make any sense. And it's logical as well, because it's, again, a distraction method. As long as you don't go into your body to connect with these overwhelming sensations, that's all that matters. And it feels as though your life depends on it. So it's a survival energy, and you can do whatever you want. You can please the entire neighborhood. You can paint my house. You can clean my bathroom. You can send money to buy guns for other people to kill each other. It doesn't matter. Because at that moment, you have saved yourself from the experience of the stressor, which is only maybe 90 seconds. I mean, that's what we're talking about. But this 90 seconds is going to be very overwhelming. Your body will do all kinds of uncontrollable things. My favorite one is uncontrollable laughter, because then it's just really funny to, to, to watch that. But I mean, people vomit, people, people uh, start gagging, and people cry a lot. I like crying. And I, I once sent this, uh, uh, this uh, another man, another client, I sent him uh, uh, an email. He was a coaching client and it was a coaching email. And I wrote that the relief of his symptoms might only be a few tears away. But then autocorrect came in and it changed a few tears into a few years. <laughs> and he, he was like very discouraged with that. Oh, what's this? Oh. But then I read it again and I, we had to laugh about it. It was very funny. But yeah, a relief of your symptoms might only be a few tears away. Isn't that a beautiful thought? So thank you for uh, for listening to the podcast. If you'd like to find out more, then please go to the website, releasecfs.com. Could you give me a like and subscribe and rate it on Spotify? That would really be helpful. And then I wish you a beautiful day. And I'll see you in the next video or podcast. 